Huh? Can we start now? Okay. <sighs> I have this light. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Martin Baer. I live in China. And um, I came with my uh, colleague, Zhu Feng. She's sitting here in the front. Um, so I will talk about um, Elastos, a uh, project that, um, as you said, may blow your mind. Um, before I talk about Elastos, I want to talk a little bit about the internet itself, the history of the internet, how it was evolved and how it came to be. So basically, the internet was built on trust. Um, when the internet was designed in the 60s, 70s, um, it was kind of assumed that everyone who would ever get onto that network was a trusted person from some trusted institution, and we knew we would know who everybody is, and we could trust everyone, and there's no bad people that would ever be able to use this. And um, so nobody thought about, um, oop. Huh, what's happening? Nobody thought about making the internet in any way uh, safe um, and build protections <coughs> against uh, bad people. Um, so um, somebody at another conference uh, um, gave a talk about IoT, and he, de he described the internet as a coffee party. So people think the internet is like a coffee party. Everybody's nice and polite, everybody's friendly, uh, um, and nobody steals anything, and nobody does bad things. Um, because of that assumption, because of um, um, believing that there are no bad people, um, no protections were built in, and so now we have a problem that we cannot keep the bad people out. Um, we have to deal with spam. We have to deal with uh, denial of service attacks. Um, we um, have problems with cookies. Cookies are being abused. Um, cookies are so bad. Um, I don't know if you are aware of this here, but in, Euro in the European Union, the European Union made a law that requires every website that uses cookies to have a, a message, a notice, um, to tell the visitor that we're using kit cookies and you have to approve that you understand what that means. Um, I don't think it changes anything, um, but basically you have to think about that. We as um, engineers, we build something that is so bad that a government has made laws to warn the common people against the threats of what we built. Um, and the same thing might be coming with, with IoT devices because um, effectively IoT made everything worse. Um, IoT devices are so hopelessly insecure that really the only thing you want to do, the only thing you can do at this point is to try to just um, block IoT devices from being able to access the internet entirely. Um, at uh, scale, the Southern California Linux Expo in Los Angeles two weeks ago, um, John Hawley gave a talk with the topic, Good Fences Make Good Neighbors in IoT. Um, and he was describing in, in graphic detail in, uh, um, what he had to do in order to, to protect his network from, from bad uh, IoT devices. Um, yeah, I'll have a link to that talk in the, uh, in the slides. So, um, are you familiar with the OC model of networking? <coughs> um, basically, the OC model uh, describes uh, um, seven network layers. There's a physical layer and a data link layer, which is mostly your cables, your, your Wi-Fi signals, and so on. There's a network layer where you run IP and uh, um, basically your, your internet connections. A transport layer where you have the network protocols, um, HTTP and uh, SSL and so on. 
Um, session layer, presentation layer, and application layer. And so basically the important thing to understand is that the, the bottom layers are mostly hardware, um, the network uh, layer and the transport layer partly are in the kernel, um, and the rest is uh, in your application. So applications are taking care of those uh, top layers. And um, And what's most important is um, applications are responsible for making their own network connections secure. So every application that is running um, is on its own responsible for making sure that it has a secure network. Your web browser is using TLS to secure the network with the web server, and your email client may use TLS or may not use TLS depending on how it's configured. Um, to secure its network connection. And every program, whatever you install, is responsible for its own. Um, and you have a TLS, a SSH, a PGP, and different ways to secure different aspects um, of the network. And you sometimes use multiple combinations of those um, um, to get the, the job done. Um, what is very important is that identification of um, Identification of um, um, communication partners, identification of people that you are communicating with is happening within um, the application. So in email, for example, the, um, the decision um, who is sending an email, who sent you an email, is, not made, is made by you as a, as a reader of the email and by the email program, by identifying the email address. And effectively, every application has its own user database. SSH is using the system database in most cases, but it could, in theory, use its own database. Most websites, web services that run on a machine have their own user database. Your mail server has a different user database. Depending on how it's configured, they all have a different source of what identities exist. And I have, I have an SSH identity, I have an email identity, I have a web identity, I have like hundreds of different identities. Even though they're all on the same machine, they're all doing different things. Um, spam effectively comes from the fact that um, there is no um, programmatic user identification. Um, when I receive an email, only me as a reader can actually identify who is the sender of this email. And uh, sometimes I can use the email address, but I cannot trust that email address. Spam can fake email addresses. And so, um, and the computer, the software has no way to 100%, to be 100% sure that some, an email is sent from the person that it uh, claims to be. Only I, as a reader, can potentially verify that. And even I, as a reader, can sometimes not even do that if I um, don't know this person very well and I know exactly whether they're going to send me that or not. Um, denial of service attacks um, are even at one level, a few levels lower. Um, they happen at the network level before even they get into the computer. Um, they just spam your computer with network packages. And there's nothing I can do um, on any machine to prevent that. Because by the time I can do anything about a bad network packet, I or the packet already is clogging the network because it's already gone through the network. I cannot stop the denial of service attacks at the source. I cannot stop spam at the source. So how do we get out of this mess? Um, by putting user identification first. By creating an operating system that allows applications to be built on a user-first paradigm. So any kind of um, networking happens, before any kind of networking happens, the applications have to identify the communication partners and verify that this communication is uh, is what we want to do. Um, so quickly, what is Elastos? Um, how are we doing it? Um, first of all, Elastos is a complete set of C++ APIs and, uh, 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 and frameworks. 
it's a um, operating system runtime that can uh, that provides end-to-end -end security um, across a peer-to-peer -peer network, and um, it's designed for containers and, and virtual machines, so it can run in any kind of environment. Um, it can also run natively, um, and it uses blockchain for um, user identities and other authentication. Uh, very quickly, the C++ API and frameworks, uh, basically it's sandbox at the C level. So we allow um, app developers to write applications in C and C++, but we're still able to provide a sandboxed environment for those applications. They're running inside um, our sandbox. And um, we have a runtime inspection system um, that allows distributed apps to, to talk to each other. And um, to, in order to get there, we rewrote the whole Android stack in C++. Um, I think about that one for a moment. Do you know how big Android is? The whole Android stack, the whole Android frameworks? I think it's about 10 million lines of code or something like that. So the whole thing has been rewritten in C++. Um, when I first uh, um, heard that, I thought that these guys are either crazy or they're genius, um, or both. So why did they do that? Um, performance, memory footprint, so we're targeting uh, um, primarily IoT devices because they're, they're the need is the greatest. Um, so we want the system to be small and compact and allow um, IoT developers to write small and compact and fast applications that don't need many resources. Um, we want to enable developers um, who are at this point mostly used to writing Android applications to be able to write C++ applications in the same style that they already learned from writing Android applications. And we also want to enable porting uh, Android applications um, directly to Elastos. We can run native Android applications, and you can use Java to write your applications. Um, but um, for a small IoT device, uh, you wouldn't really want that. Um, the distributed OS runtime. So basically, um, we're building a network on top of the internet, and we're using peer-to-peer -to, -peer to, um, to um, connect the uh, devices and nodes. And the idea is, um, yeah, so we're providing end-to-end -end security across that network. And um, when the network connection happens, um, so, um, sorry, the key point is we prohibit apps from doing their own networking. So all the networking is going through the operating system, and this is the important part. Um, every network connection is approved by the operating system. So um, applications no longer do their own networking, and that uh, um, addresses the problem in CRUD. So now I'm going to explain a little more detail. So uh, you've seen that slide uh, before, and um, when Elastos comes into the picture, um, it looks like this. So Elastos is taking over those uh, middle layers, uh, transport, session, and presentation layer, pretty much, and part of the application layer. And the applications really are mostly responsible for the user interface, for the application logic, but they're no longer responsible for networking. Networking is effectively the same in every application, so there's no need to repeat all that into every application. Um, and so we are providing the networking um, as a service to the application, and the applications themselves just use that. Um, and so what we achieve by doing that is we're able to move the user identification away from the application layer. We're um, basically um, um, letting the apps um, specify that they want to talk to a certain identity. If I want to send a message to you, then um, um, I will have your identity in some form as a cryptographic key. And then um, the application um, sends a request to the operating system that I want to send a message to this person. Um, and then the operating system will use the peer-to-peer -peer network to find that identity. So there's no more IP addresses involved. I mean, yes, in the lower level, of course, there's IP. but 
um, for the um, applications, the IP addresses no longer matter. The applications don't say, I want to talk to this IP address. They just say, I want to talk to this identity. The operating system goes out and finds the identity wherever it may be. It could be moving around from one machine to another. It's certainly going to move around from one IP address to another because depending on where you are, your mobile phone or your computer may have a different IP address. And once it found that identity and basically with the uh, key exchange verified, but this is the correct identity. And also then both sides have verified that they actually approve for this communication to happen. Only after that, the application itself will be able to send a message to that recipient. And so this authentication um, the verification happens in the beginning so that basically uh, um, we can approve that we are communication partners. And then after that, uh, um, the operating system just checks that all these checks are in place. And as a user, I don't actually notice that there's something going on. The message just gets sent. Um, so the connections are only open after the user IDs have been verified and the connection has been approved. And so this way, we basically uh, um, prevent any form of spam, denial of service attacks, worms, viruses, and what have you, because applications cannot just do what they want on the internet. And instead of having identities on the application level, we have a kind of network-wide um, system of identities that can be verified uh, uh, through uh, cryptographic keys. OK, C continuing um, the runtime. Um, so basically, uh, um, you can imagine um, if you're familiar with Java, the uh, um, Java virtual machine, it's kind of like a Java virtual machine, but it's a C, C++ virtual machine um, and runtime. And so there's no need to break out of that virtual machine or in order to write native code. That's a problem Java has. You have occasionally a situation where Java runtime doesn't provide what you need, and you need to write some stuff in C++ or C, and then you break out of this uh, um, uh, Java runtime and use a Java native interface to write native code. And so we don't need to do that because we already are at the C++ C level. And so you can basically um, always stay within the sandbox um, in order to um, do everything that you need to do. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like providing a hybrid programming model where you can write in C, C++. You can write in any kind of runtime language, C, scripting language, Python, <coughs> Ruby, or anything else you like. Um, you can write in Java um, or any other language. Basically, anything that uh, can potentially compile to C, which is pretty much everything. And um, you get kind of like an, an Android-like programming environment um, and feeling like you're, you're programming for Android, but you're doing it in C++ or in other languages. Um, now. Where does the blockchain come in? I've already mentioned the blockchain is um, used uh, for once for uh, managing user IDs. So we're going to put the user IDs onto the blockchain, and then um, we're using the blockchain to, to verify that these IDs um, are uh, uh, genuine and are the ones that we want to talk to. Um, there are other uses for the blockchain. Um, one example is um, digital asset management. So what we're doing is we're actually, we're um, on top of just using the blockchain for our networking, we're also providing a blockchain development environment so you can write blockchain applications. But the key point is we're not only about blockchain applications. You can write blockchain applications, you can write regular applications that just do networking. You can write applications that don't do networking if you don't need to. You can write any kind of applications, like in, in any kind of uh, development system, like in Android. Um, and the blockchain is just part of the a set of uh, features that are being offered to, to application writers. And there's also um, uh, coins to, to enable trading and to enable uh, uh, market-like uh, uh, applications and, and things like that. Um, I want to um, expand on, on this thing, uh, uh, what we call digital assets. Um, that's kind of a, a key point uh, um, from a, a free software perspective because basically if you look at today, 
we have um, a few types of digital content and a few ways to share digital content. And one is uh, um, free to share, which is GNU, which you um, probably all know, Creative Commons, where you can basically uh, share and do um, pretty much whatever you want with it, um, as long as you follow the license. Um, and then there is um, DRM free, um, which is, um, you can share it, but it's actually, uh, um, you're not legally allowed to share it. I mean, it's like, it's like you can copy it, but then you would be uh, um, breaking the law, but nobody's stopping you from, from doing it. And then um, we have um, leased and title controlled by distributors, uh, digital rights management, uh, um, or digital restriction management, however you want to call that, um, where the, the, the distributor controls what you do with the content that you received. Um, I don't know if you still remember the story when Amazon um, decided to delete the book 1984 from everybody's Kindle devices. And so you bought that book and you were maybe in the middle of reading it, and then Amazon decides that um, we're terminating that license and we're just going to take it away from everybody. Um, that's what DRM gives you, and that's what we don't want. So with the blockchain, we can offer another alternative. The blockchain allows us to track ownership of a piece of digital content. And because we can track the ownership, that means we can allow the reselling of content, um, which enables this uh, secondary market, which in, in, in the world of books uh, uh, used to be a big uh, issue that when you buy a book, um, whether were you allowed to re resell the book that you bought or not, um, there have been lawsuits fought about that. And uh, at least in the US, it has been made very clear that there is no way that you can prevent anybody from reselling a book that they ever bought. Um, I don't know how it is in Singapore. Um, and in other countries, uh, um, it may be the same or worse. But the point is, with digital assets on the blockchain, we enable this same uh, mechanism where when you own, when you buy a piece of digital content, whether it's a book or a movie or something else um, or a program, you are able to resell it because you can prove um, that you made that sale and the uh, programs that, that read your digital content, they can verify on the blockchain whether you still have the permission to read it or whether you sold it and you don't actually have it anymore. The, the important part is that we're taking away the control from distrib distributors to decide what happens with this content. And we're giving that control to the consumer who is buying the content, who can then decide who to give it to next. Um, a bit about the history. Um, Elastos development started um, around the year 2000 um, as a research project at uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. Um, and they were trying to build a smartphone operating system. And when iOS and Android came out, um, they stopped uh, working on that. Um, Tu Feng may have some more details on, on that story. Um, then in 2012, uh, development was restarted. Um, it was then uh, it received uh, $30 million funding by Foxconn and um, it reached uh, beta status. So the $30 million were basically used to, um, at least as my understanding is, were used to um, rewrite that Android runtime. Um, so we got, um, we got Elastos running natively on a bunch of devices, beta status. Um, that phone, um, I actually have it here if somebody wants to take a look later. Um, running Elastos natively. Um, although now, um, I didn't mention that before, um, <coughs> Elastos will not run natively on the phones. That's not our target at the moment, although it technically could. But we're actually building a um, Android and iOS runtime environment that you can basically install into your Android phone, into your um, iOS phone, and then run Elastos apps within that environment. So you don't have to uh, um, flash your phone with a new operating system because nobody really wants to do that. Um, 
So blockchain development started last year in 2017. Um, there was uh, um, a private funding round um, funded with, uh, um, from Bitcoin investors. And then in January, we had an ICO and we got the more, uh, some more Bitcoins. And you can already see from the numbers, the ICO was not done to get money in order to fund the project because we already had a bunch of money, but it was more done to, to get mind share and to get people actually interested in the project. Um, and so the roadmap is currently uh, um, we're working on the peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, I've, uh, I've seen the reports from the developers that this is already um, now in a, in, a, in a working state. Um, and there's work done with the development partners to build um, strategic applications that we want uh, in the ecosystem. Um, the, the blockchain um, part is, is being worked on. We're adding features like side chains so that um, blockchain applications don't have to put everything on the main chain. Um, we're building a fra framework for web applications so that you can run apps within the browser um, in the same and still have the same advantages. And um, there's going to be uh, the, the public mining of the um, ELA uh, tokens will uh, start at the end of the year. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, if you download the slides, um, I have trouble uploading them, but I will try to get them uploaded um, before the conference ends or at least a few days after the conference. Um, then you can get all these links uh, uh, from the slides. Um, the uh, resource links is mostly uh, GitHub and the Elastos website. Um, and um, yeah, with that, um, I want to close. Uh, just one more uh, 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 thing. Um, I've been giving this, t giving this talk at uh, uh, a few conferences now and everywhere I go. I'm trying to um, assemble all the people who are working with blockchain in the free software community because I have a feeling that there's not enough free software in the blockchain world. The blockchain world is dominated by, by investors, by ICOs, by token trading, um, and there's not enough focus on development, on focus on free software, focus on, on the ideals that the free software community uh, um, wants to um, share. And so I want to get us uh, together. And um, to that end, um, at the end of this um, track, tomorrow afternoon, after the last blockchain talk, we're going to have a, um, a, um, a meetup of all people who are interested in blockchain development um, to share what we can do as a community um, to strengthen our case um, in, the, in the blockchain world and in the world as such. And um, also just mentioning there's going to be a blockchain track at the Hong Kong Open Source Conference in June. And I'm also preparing one for the Cost Cup in Taiwan. And I'm still looking for volunteers to, to help me with that. Um, that's it. Um, you've already seen this slide um, about me. And uh, um, Zhu Feng, as I mentioned, she's here. She has been working on Elastos um, very, very early in the years 2003 to 2006. So she can tell you a little bit about the early history of Elastos. And she rejoined the project uh, um, this year as a, as a, as a product, man product manager. Um, yeah, and the links to the slides. Um, so questions? Yes. As a, as a programmer, is there anything about using Elastos that you have to change your mental model for you know, this, how it treats network access? Um, yes, you will have to change your, uh, your mental model as, it, as far as network access is concerned. Because you're no longer thinking about, um, say, uh, um, the most common way to work with today is that you have some kind of URL. And the URL specifies a host name. It specifies a path. It may specify a user identity um, and, or like an email address. And so and then you um, have to figure out, OK, what kind of URL is this? Is this a web URL? Is it an email address? Um, so how do I send a message? Or is it an, uh, an IRC address or something like that? How do I uh, um, send a message to this person? Um, and depending on what you want to support in your application, 
um, then you have to write your, 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 your networking code accordingly. You open a connection to this port and then you start sending your um, HTTP. There are libraries for, of course, for all of these, but there's a different library for each way. There's a library for email, there's a library for HTTP requests, there's a library for sending uh, um, Java XMPP messages and so on. And so now you will have one library framework for networking and all you're putting in is a user or application identity and you want to connect with this particular identity and then um, um, you wait for the approval and then uh, you get the socket to send a message. Can you still use uh, Android applications that uh, usual Android application or do we have to uh, only use the last source applications? Because your change is on the network layer, so I'm just wondering. Um, okay, there are two answers to this. The question is, can you use or write uh, um, regular Android applications? Um, so for one, yes, you can still write applications in Java and you can write uh, um, pretty much uh, traditional Android applications as long as they don't do networking um, because the networking system is changing. Um, so if you want to run inside the Elastos environment, you have to use the Elastos way of networking, but the rest will stay the same. And on top of that, you can write your applications in C++ in the same logic and structure as you would do it in Android because we're basically duplicating that, uh, uh, that way of developing. Yes? You mentioned using blockchain. Uh, is that public blockchain or are you using your own? And if you're using the public place for, for fees? Um, okay, I'm, um, so the question is, if we're using a public blockchain or if we use our own blockchain, um, I'm not uh, sure about the details here, but um, what I understand is that this is actually flexible. So we um, pretty much have our own blockchain ecosystem, but we are working with Neo um, um, for, the, uh, for the whole blockchain technology. And so um, I'm not sure if we're using Neo's main blockchain um, or if we're using our own. Um, but basically, we're also providing an, a, an environment for other people to write their own blockchain applications. Um, and so um, we're having at least one main blockchain where, where Elastos is running on, and then a lot of side chains uh, um, for, for different applications um, that don't need to be on the main chain. So um, um, it's, uh, um, it's, it's pretty complex. Um, and I haven't really looked into that detail yet because it's still evolving and uh, it may change uh, over time depending on, on what makes most sense. Any other questions? What time is the meetup tomorrow? The meetup tomorrow is after the last talk. So I think the last talk ends at 2.25, so at 2.30 in the same room as the last blockchain talk. So basically, just look at the blockchain track at the end. Uh, um, actually, I'm, um, so this is this was not is not on the official schedule, but it has been approved by the uh, um, by the organizers, and uh, but they couldn't put it on the on the online schedule because they're too busy uh, solving other problems. Um, but I'm gonna after this, I'm gonna go around and everywhere I see the schedule printed, I'm gonna pencil in that we're gonna have this event so people can see it. I'm gonna put it on the board downstairs. Um, yeah, I hope, and you spread the word. If you talk to anybody about blockchain, mention uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon to, to come here after the talk, after the last one, so that we can share and, and, and connect. All right, thank you. Okay.